as promised, but long overdue, <laughs> very long overdue, we're going to be talking today about um, life as a travel nurse practitioner, but in general, just um, locum tenens, which can qualify as um, a physician assistant as well, and I believe a CRNA too. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about. We'll be answering some of you guys' questions. Um, I'm going to go on and introduce myself and just a little bit about my journey. And then you can introduce yourself after, right? Okay. That sounds good to me. Okay. <laughs> I know you're familiar with Nurse Haskins because she's on there. She's on right now. All right. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, um, you guys, my name is Ebony. If you're new to just my page in general, I'm Ebony. I'm a travel nurse practitioner. I've been working as a travel nurse practitioner since 2019. Um, I'm a family medicine nurse practitioner, so I do everything family health from birth all the way, even though I don't like kids like that. I always tell you that. But <laughs> from birth all the way up to um, older age and pretty much everything, just a primary care provider. Um, I started this journey in 2019 after working as an urgent care provider for four months by myself. So basically I work, um, I, you know, I'm new to the NP role. I didn't really know like the process like that and stuff like that. So I was a staff nurse practitioner in urgent care. And uh, I had two days of orientation in urgent care as a staff NP, a new staff NP. And um I, after my two days of orientation, I was pretty much told that I was going to be by myself. So I was by myself with another medical assistant, um, basically managing about 30, it can go as high as like 50 patients a day in urgent care, all acute cases. Um, but pretty much it was a scary, uh, scary experience by myself, like as a new provider. So after four months, of like just not taking it anymore. I didn't know what I was going to do next. Um, I decided to, um, I was blessed, let me say that, because not a lot of people can end up going into being a travel, a locum tenant and travel nurse practitioner after four months of experience. But with a lot of my travel background as a travel nurse in general, and then with the experience I had being a sole provider in the clinic that I worked in, I ended up pretty much... Um, getting the job. My first, very first position was in uh, family medicine, primary care, and I worked there for six months. And after that, it's been history since then. So Max has gotten, Max, right? Yeah. Max had got me a couple of positions in urgent care and other, other places that I usually pick up with him. And you can introduce yourself to everybody. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for taking the time, of course, to join in. Uh, you know, we're very excited about this. Like Miss Evan said, long overdue. We were, um, you know, we wanted to, to do this for a little while now, but with their schedule uh, and, you know, a little bit of mine, it was a little bit, um, it was a little bit hard to, to come together, but we finally did it. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm super excited to be here. So a little bit about me. I've been working as a recruiter now for about four years. And um, it's it's really good. It's really good. There's ups and downs, of course, like anything else, but building relationships with providers that, like, you know, do such an important job. And most people, when they go to the doctors or they, you know, go to a hospital, most people don't really know about locums, right? I mean, I didn't know anything about locums before I became a recruiter. And the the position itself so important, staffing places in rural, rural cities that don't get a lot of, um, you know, providers, you know, building relationship with providers, helping them out, and, you know, in turn, they help you out, you learn a lot about the field, and just, it, it's amazing, right, but of course, there's hard parts about it, like everything else, and, um, which is why we're here to help alleviate some of those questions, and, um, you know, myself gave you guys as far as like the recruiting aspect of it the recruitment side the agency side so you guys kind of have that with uh, miss ebony giving you guys of course the um the provider side 
Yes, I'm just updating the um, pin, I'm pinning the comment. I mean, the talk to send you one so that people can ask their questions because we did get a few questions. And like you, I didn't know about locum tenens. Like, I remember when I was in school, um, not knowing, even though I had a family, I was in the path of the family nurse practitioner, I didn't really have an idea, like, what I wanted to do. Like, whereas my other classmates, they was like, I'm going to go into hematology. I'm going to go into, you know, pulmonology or stay in primary care. I had no clue what I wanted to do. And I was like, you know what, I'll figure it out when I graduate. When I graduated, I still had no idea what I wanted to do, that I stayed as a travel nurse, a registered nurse for a whole year before getting my first position as a nurse practitioner, because I just didn't want to get into anything like, and not, and, and then regret it, you know? So educate will always be my love, but I was like, you know what? I need to branch off into other things. So they had came, uh, I remember a company, I'm not sure exactly what the company was, or the name of the company, they had came to our career day event in school. And I had that was my very first time that I had a glimpse of like, um, being a travel MP, but I didn't know the, the term locum tenens, right. So they, um, they was just telling me about it. And then I'm like, Oh, this sounds cool. This sounds dope. This sounds like something that I want to do. But they were like, you ain't had you don't got no experience. So I was just like, Okay, <laughs> well, it ain't for me now. I don't know if it'll be for me for the future. But for a person that didn't know, like, what they wanted to do, um, it, it just sounded like a perfect idea. And then I had came across, um, I was doing research. It's not much research on YouTube. So I have a YouTube channel, but I need to, I need to do better. I know I do, but it's talking about a lot, a lot about travel MP and I, I will do better. I promise. But, um, I couldn't find the information that I needed to, to be a travel MP. And then I came across a, bro a blog, her, um, name is the traveling MP.com. Her name is Sophia. And that was the first person, like, I had emailed, like, look, I want to be a travel MP. She told me, look, get your year of experience. And then um, once you get your year of experience and you get into that role, it'll be easier for you to, um, thank you. It'll be easier for you to, thank you, to, to get other contracts, you know? So, like I said, I was blessed to be one to have a, a NP contract right after four months of experience because, as you, you know, that's, like, unusual, um, absolutely. right absolutely and, uh, you know that's one of the things we get the most right uh, because a lot of times like you said a lot of travel nurses end up you know because they're used to the traveling lifestyle as an RN look at travel MP and you know they're used to the travel piece so they're like oh I want to do that as an MP as well but that is a lot more difficult because of the fact that you know providers in the locum game, they have to be, you know, for lack of a better term, a plug and play provider, right? Where you kind of, maybe you might walk into, well, most of the time you walk into a situation where the client doesn't have time or um, doesn't have the time to train. So they need someone that has somewhat of an experience to kind of come in, do one day of orientation. Um, if you already know the EMR even better, so you can hit the ground running. So that's, we use that term a lot, hit the ground running, because that's essentially what a lot of the clients look for. So mm -hmm. one of the, uh, you know, questions I get a lot, and, you know, and a lot of providers ask me, they're like, hey, I'm a new NP, can I do local work? So I think that's a very good one to uh, start off some mm -hmm. of the questions with because that, that happens a lot and again it makes sense because a lot of the you know newer nurses for the most part they're a bit younger they want to travel and they for that piece they fit the locum um, you know locum criteria and uh, what we look for someone who's available ready to travel but uh, again as I mentioned before with the experience piece that's where it usually happens so it's not impossible to place a new grad MP is just a lot harder. So for if anyone in this, um, you know, on this live is a newer grad or a new grad thinking about it, a couple of things I want to say to that. One, uh, just know that in order for a recruiter to place you, one, um, I would say the number one thing I would say you have to be a little bit more flexible than a provider with 
experience because as far as the uh, how a recruiter is able to market you to the client in the marketplace is that hey this provider yes yeah, she's newer she's uh, you know she's uh what was the word we use um you know she she just got done with the training in, in school so she can she can be moldable she's coachable um and some clients do like that and also too they're coming at a better rate than providers with 10 15 years experience especially when it's a client that has a smaller budget right so things like that we may be able to do and for the provider they have to you know be able um you know to to kind of like you did a little bit right i mean it's going to be scary that's the number it's going to be scary because mm -hmm. you're you're going to be you're going to be out there now you might not be a sole provider where you're the only one there but uh you know you kind of have to be ready to hold your own right and and we and as your recruiter if he's the right one he's going to put you in a place where you know you have the support or so you can call someone or, you know, you can have the potential, have the patient come the next day if there's a complex case or something like that. But you have to, you know, kind of be ready. Or you have to go into home health, okay? Get mm -hmm. the home health experience because a lot of times you don't need a DEA for home health. And, uh, you know, you can just, you can, you can go in and start practicing and gain that experience in home health and doing your assessments and, you know, looking at the chronic diseases and, you know, helping out. Uh, those those patients and you know with six months to a year uh, closer to like you know six seven months at that point you know you can do like uh, like with Ebony do some urgent care some you know some PRN work pick up some per diem work you know you pick up a shift here and there and that counts as experience you know that counts as experience yeah I would say that um, for my very first position I felt like the only reason that they hired me after four months was not only the travel nursing that I had, that background of just jumping into the role, but because I had told them, like, I only had one day of experience, two days of experience as a nurse, new nurse practitioner, and the caseload that I had as an urgent care provider. Now, when I pick up assignments, I try to avoid that because it's like, even though it's like, okay, it's not nothing to brag about. It's not nothing to, like, be like, hey, I did this. It was stressful. So when I tell Max about these assignments, when he gives me this, the first thing that I look at is the patient load or would I be the sole provider there? No matter how much experience that I do have now, because I don't want to be put back in that position. Now, there are providers that don't care and they'll be like, yeah, look, let's get to the bag. That's it. When can I start? Call it a day and stuff like that. But it all it all depends. It all goes back and forth. Right. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. I definitely, definitely agree with that. And uh, most, most these days too, uh, you know, patient volume is so recently with COVID, what ended up happening for a lot of primary care and urgent care, a lot of people were going into the urgent care when things were still closed, right? Where your P, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, your primary care doc was the, the offices were closed, the urgent cares are still open. So everyone's going there for anything. So patient volume went up all the way up in the point where you know uh don't want to say it was right but it was just the reality that we were facing right and um some some new entries actually use that uh time to get the experience i i know mm -hmm. of someone um you Me know, too. she had yeah, she did. A lot of new MPs ended up uh, using COVID to get experience, and it worked out perfectly for them because a lot of people did not want to be in the urgent care, did not want to, you know, be out there. They, they took some time off, and then uh, so a lot of new MPs were like, "Hey, I'll do it," you know. And I've actually placed uh, I placed a few people in the in the, uh, the Bronx area, uh, you know, with that end up working in the in the urgent care. But also, too, I do want to say that the put. I was very careful with where I, I placed them because I didn't want to, you know, do, I, I do not work in, uh, I did not do any placements in the ICU where, you know, it was really dangerous and, um, you know, there were lack of PPEs or anything like that, or more so in the urgent care where they have an MA, they have a scribe, they have someone they can call if anything mm -hmm. happens. So, of course, like, you know, I did my due diligence on that part as well to make sure they were supported and they were not going to be thrown in a situation to fail just because, uh, you know, contract needed to, to be filled or a job needed to be filled. 
Right. And that's why that that goes to that comes to tell well, that goes to show that this is why I had asked I, I worked with a ton of um recruiters before. But this goes to show why I asked for you to be on the live because you have recruiters out there that don't care about where you worked at but is trying to place you in any other like any position, even if you're like, look, I don't really have experience in that position, but they will fight they will try their best to try to place you in that. So that goes to show why I had introduced you, like I had told you, like, look, you have to hop on this live with these people right, and no, explain I to them. That. Mm-hmm. I, I know, I know, you know, I know the, the, the rep that most recruiters get right. And, and again, I, the way I try to, to do it and look at it is if I, if I were to be a provider, we'll see when I will be, but if I were to be a provider, how would I want my recruiter to, to, to be with me, right? How would I want a recruiter to be? So that's how I try to do it and try to have the compassion about it and not just looking at it as, okay, this is just, uh, you know, this is just someone where I'm just going to place and, and look to, 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 you know, to do my job and just look at it strictly like a job, right? Where my job is to place you. So no matter what, like, I'm just going to try and do that, whatever it sticks, sticks. No, people that work like that, there's no, there's no surprise that, you know, problems end up happening. The, the providers end up not wanting to work with them. They end up choosing other recruiters to work with and, and stuff like that because there's not that compassion. There's not that care. And, and providers can tell, right? If I'm just like, you're like, oh, I'm not really that comfortable and I'm pushing you to do it. And I'm like, no, come on, you should still do it. Or I still send your, your portfolio down without you knowing. I still tell you, hey, there's, a, there's an interview or, you know, I put the pressure on you to try and do it. That that it's not it's not a feel good, you know. So I, I always like to make sure I in the front end before I even work with a provider, I let them know my process. This is how I work. This yeah, you sure I, did. I like to you told me. And, <laughs> yeah, like that's 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 how that's how I like to do it. And you know, some people have their processes, and and uh, providers like a certain way of things to be done. And you know, if it, if it works well with my style then we go ahead and, and we work together but at the same time too you know if it doesn't because this is a it's it's a relationship where right? the recruiter and provider relationship it's a two-way relationship so like the my the way i work i have to be moldable and you know bendable to to work with you and the same thing with the provider as well especially mm-hmm. when they're working with someone who knows what they're talking about because my my goal, of course, is to be successful and is to have you be a successful low-income tenants provider. So, and I, I know how to do that. So us working together, it has to be a team-like mentality, right? And not me saying like, oh, this is just a where I'm just going to place you. And the provider is not looking at the recruiter. Well, this is just someone who's just going to find me jobs, right? I don't have to communicate like that. I don't have to tell them whatever, like, you're, you know? So it has mm-hmm. to be a mutual respect. It has to be like, um, you know, certain level of uh, likability and, and all of that for it to be a really good solid relationship to, uh, so your career can be you know fruitful it can be fun because that's the whole point of doing locums you want to have fun you want to travel you know you don't want to be shackles of uh, you know the term the politics the you know all of that you want it to mm-hmm. be fun so and you kind of have to work with that recruiter to build that relationship I agree. So that goes to the first question. We have questions on the side, but I just wanted to keep it more uh, like in relationship to what you said about recruiters. So um, one person wrote, how do you make sure you have a good recruiter that is in the best interest in mind? Um, so how do you make sure? Okay. So I would say the how, how they communicate right? Number one, how they communicate with you and with, with anything over time, you'll be able to tell. Now, there might be some people that are, you know, just really good at what, you know, at saying one thing and just like, you know, completely doing something different, right? So what you look for in a good recruiter is someone who is going to be able to tell you the good and the bad, right? And that kind of just like go over those and look to find solutions and not just, well, this is just what it is. Right. It's just like because on the desk level, there's a lot of things that happen where we don't really have control over. Right. But if I don't, if something happens where I can either say, you know, bring it to the account rep 
or bring it to my director, you know, and they can tell me, oh, no, we can't really do that. Or, or just me knowing, right? Let's say something happens and I know that, okay, well, with this particular issue, um, there's not much I can do. And I can just tell you that, hey, you know, from my experience, you know, there's not much I can do and kind of just leave it like that, right? And you're like, okay, well, that, that's not really that helpful. Or I can just always look to go that one step above and go talk to more people, talk to the account rep, have them talk to their client, have them talk to my director, maybe put you in touch with my, you know, my supervisor or someone like that, where I'm looking to make something happen and we're going to try and do everything we can and not just throw in the towel like that, right? So that's one thing I would say. Someone that keeps trying when, when issues uh, happen. Another one I would say is with time, you will be able to tell. Are they looking proactively for you? Are they, you know, are they looking to build your schedule ahead of time? Are they looking to get you credentialed? Are they looking for new licenses? Are they, you know, all these things do matter when you're doing locums because you don't want a recruiter that works reactively. When I say reactively, that's like you, you get on a six month contract, okay, by month, uh, say, for one reason or another, by month five, okay, you still haven't heard anything of an extension and the recruiter is not bringing any, any, any new business or any mm -hmm. new opportunities by you. And, you know, then month six contract ends and you're back out there and there's still nothing. That's when he's trying to do something, right? So you don't want that. Even when you're on assignment, there should still be other, you know, other opportunities, like uh, they should be telling you about different clients, like depending on how you like it, of course. But even then, if even if you love the assignment, they should still be running different stuff by you because the goal is to get you credentialed with different facilities, right? The way I explain it is like, if you have three licenses and you're licensed in three of my best states, okay? And you're credentialed with two or three facilities in those three states, that's six to nine facilities that you're credentialed with that are always going to be calling for you. So you can't run out of work. Now, to make that even, you know, make it more, adding a new license, right? Adding a new license and getting you in those places that you want to be, getting you credentialed with a few of those. So at that point, you're going to have too much work. That's how you want it, where you're mm -hmm. already on assignment, and you have someone calling you, like Miss Ebony, for example, she's on assignment, and I'm calling her about work, okay? Even when she's credentialed with one facility, I'm saying, hey, there's another facility we can get credentialed that. Like, you know, if, we, if your schedule can make it, if the schedule can't, you know, it can't happen, that's completely fine, right? So, but those are some of the things that you can look for in a recruiter, you know, as far as that, like how they speak with you, how often they call you, how many opportunities they bring, how proactive are they with getting new opportunities. And of course, too, like the other piece of it too is the money piece. Let's not forget about that part. That's really important, okay? Um, the way they explain to you the budgets, right? After each contract that you do, you should in theory, or he should in theory try to get you a little bit more. Now, it's not a foolproof plan. It doesn't always happen, but it's the asking. It's, you know, like they say, closed mouths don't get fed. If I'm not saying anything to my client rep to bring it to his client, okay, nothing's going to happen. You're just going to stay there. Right now, sometimes client, client's budget's tapped up. Nothing we can do, right? We can look at other different opportunities with, with uh, clients with bigger budgets, some hospitals with, uh, you know, that have bigger budgets, and we can look to get in there. But it shouldn't be a stagnant thing, right? They should always be trying, letting you know, like, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is, uh, this is what I did. This is what I'm doing to try to get you more and make that, you know, make that job better for you and just, uh, you know, making sure that they're doing everything they can to, um, you know, help you get along better, have you love the lifestyle and not pick another recruiter, right? They gotta, they, mm -hmm. we want, we want to be the provider's number one to go. We want that, right? That's, that's the goal because we know how competitive it is out there. So if someone's not doing something, Someone else is going to be doing it, all right? So I try to make sure I do everything to beat my competition, you know? So that's what I would say to that question. Yeah, I agree. Um, I would say that I haven't, I didn't learn that until actually after my first contract. Um, what had happened was, like, 
we were on the fence on whether we were going to extend the contract or not. And then when I reached out to my recruiter, like, what's up with the extension? Are they planning? On... I didn't know if I wanted to extend there anyways. But when I reached out to my recruiter, I'm. So are we not extending? And then he was like, actually, they, they decided to cut your contract early. And I said, wait, what? Are you as my recruiter telling me that? oh, they decided to cut it early. Did you even look at my contract? Did you even vouch for me? So you need a, per, a recruiter that's actually going to, to to vouch for you and be like, hey, look, I'm going to get the job done. So I absolutely, absolutely 100% agree with you with that. Absolutely. And on the contract piece, very, very important. You got to know the questions to ask the recruiter as far as like how does it work. A lot of providers mm -hmm. don't know about their 30-day option or the client's 30-day option. They're mm -hmm there's they should be holding the client accountable if like you're getting your contracts getting um you know cut for without that 30-day option because you, mm -hmm. your recruiter should let you know all these things right how can in uh you know using this this conversation you guys should like be able to you know i'm going to give you the keys when you're talking to recruiters about what to ask for right if you're about to mm -hmm. go to assignment when you most agencies before you go on assignment or before you do business with the, the agency, they send you their, um, you know, client service agreement or kind of something like that, that gives you their process, right? How does it work? This is what you can do. Take your time, read it, you know? Um, and, and that's why I like to send it even before we're getting talking about assignments. As soon as I figure out, you know, we uh, want another, yeah, okay. you know, we mm -hmm. want to work together exactly. Like, I send it out so you can take your time and read it. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I, I explain, okay, when you're reading it, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to call me, okay? Do not hesitate to call me so I can go over step by step with you and so you know what's expected, all right? Um so as far as as far as like when contracts are ending, I see someone asking about it. There are few reasons in uh, you know depending on the agency and their contract with the client that the client can end a contract without a thirty day option. The most important one is either clinical reasons. If you go on there on an assignment and the clinical skills are not what they're what they're expecting. For example, you're not seeing the patient volume or patients are complaining. Patient complaints is probably one of the quickest ones, to be honest with you. Patient complaints, you know, we get a couple of those, you know, depending on it and the relationship with the account rep, you know, they'll bring it up. Hey, uh, you know, we got a couple of patient complaints, what's happening? You know, we, we, we might need to have a backup ready because uh, that can't happen. And it, it's a business. If the customer is not satisfied, you know, there's going to be a problem, of course. But for, you know, if they find a permanent uh, doctor that's coming in or permanent MP that's starting, you will get a 30 day saying, hey, you know, we got a permanent starting um, and we appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate your work, but, you know, we have to give you a 30 day. So the only reason, one of the few only reasons why a contract can get terminated, um, you know, without a 30 day is a one clinical uh, clinical reasons where there's patient complaints, the provider is not, um, you know, doing what's on that contract. Two, safety, you know, um, for, and that goes on both sides, like for a safety piece. If the provider doesn't feel safe for whatever reason, a patient attack, you know, or there's whatever reason you feel like your life is in danger or your well being is in danger, you third. Okay, or, or you can might if something happened, okay, where someone hit you or something like that, you you can you know you, you can go ahead and, and terminate that contract because you know your life is in danger. If you're sick, if you you know um, like you just happen to get sick, you can't go to work. Like you know that that can that can happen. Okay, um, and but for the most part, for the most part, with anything like um, you know if it's if it's um, not say you have a different option or something like that, you can 30 day. A lot of providers kind of feel a way about 30 day, right? Because they're like, oh, I don't want to, you know, 
cut my contract early or something like that. I do want to say that if you're doing good work and you happen to 30 day or for whatever reason may be, your recruiter A should put it in terms that is is going to make sure you stay in good standing. If I'm working with Miss Ebony, okay, and say she got a better contract either through me or through my competitor. She says, Max, um, you know, I got a better contract. I know there's still three months left in mine, but, you know, I can't pass that opportunity. Okay. Uh, you know, being honest with you guys, I try to find out a little bit more about that opportunity that she can't pass. So I can look for opportunities that are similar to that because if she's leaving that contract for something better, I always want to find out what the better is so I can replicate that, right? And then I'm not going to tell the client that my provider just found a better job so she's leaving, you know? There's there's a level of, uh, you know, discreetness that we use as recruiters, you know, we'll say there's like, you know, there's, uh, she has to take personal time for whatever reason. And, you know, we come up with the reasons to make sure that it doesn't negatively affect you for, you know, say, a year down the line or nine months down the road. If they do have another need and you're available, you're still interested since it wasn't a bad contract, you can go back, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't negatively affect you that if you leave there after you put in your 30 day, that you're, you're no longer welcome. But I'll say it again, it does matter with the clinical skills or you have to, have to, have to, you know, do good. Have to be, you know, you know, the patients have to be satisfied. The client has to be satisfied because if there's issues, they won't want to bring you back. Right. And, but um, that goes to the next question. How much experience is needed, if any, to do locum tenens? So I don't, you said you worked with, with new grads before. I, if you wanted me to give my personal experience as a provider, I still consider myself new. I, I mean, I literally became an NP in 2019. And then quickly, I didn't even get a year of experience. Quickly, after four months of experience, I became a locum. So there's stuff that, like, I'm still learning, per se. But that's why I always, re when, when Max reach out to me, I always be like, hey, is there going to be other providers and are they willing to train? Right? So that's that's the that's the thing or like what's their orientation process or something like that but when it comes to like just being like say you have 15 plus years of experience I would assume I don't know though you don't really need a year of experience in that sense like to become a locum I could be wrong that's why you're here to correct me yeah, so I mean you don't I won't say you don't need it right you don't but need it just... as much it's just, it's just, it's just better. Okay. And I'll say, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll explain why. So it's like I said, right. We've worked depending on, um, you know, and there's been, there's been, cases where, you know, providers, new grads have gone on assignment for six months to a year at a, you know, major hospital, major client. It's yeah. Happened. Those are the ones that's like, it's like just, every time I see those contracts, they're like, Oh, we're willing to train a new grad. Like, and they really right, right, do, yeah. Right. Um, they and, they make that clear. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, and also, too, the provider themselves have they have to also. Not everyone, I would say, not everyone's kind of like I guess on the same scale as as readiness or readiness to jump into a contract without uh you know, the words like that you said or outlined like willing to train right some providers mm -hmm. i've seen it before that they're like hey I i've been doing this you know i took a i took a you know a, a suture in class and you know i'm ready to go into urgent care for some per diem work and whatnot. so again it, it, everyone's a little bit different depending on where you're at and how you feel and you know maybe some horror stories you heard or how you know about like uh, protecting your license or you know how you feel about that but the experience piece matters in the sense that, like I was saying at the, um, earlier on, it, when you're when you're being marketed, right, and the competition is so high that depending on the client and the situation, if you have someone coming in, especially if it's a kind of like a, a, a more uh, facility that sees a little bit more complex cases, uh, you know, because I do primary care mostly, and that's why I specialize in, right. So if it's a facility that's more uh, that sees a lot more complex chronic cases they want someone that can handle that okay 
they want someone that can handle, uh, you know, the the patients that are coming in with those complex cases and not get or you know, and not feel um, that they're not ready or not make a you know a bad a bad choice or a bad judgment call or something like that. Now it all depends on the type of assignment that you're gonna take as a you know newer grad and where your recruiter feels like you know they'll be able to do it. For example, mm -hmm. I currently have. Um, you know, a position open right now um, for New Jersey and Ohio. It's this client that's training, which you know, but that's that that that's doing um, home health and wound care. You know, and they train for that. So that will be a position where it will be a little bit easier for a new grad to get in. Now it's still going to be hard because providers that you know have been doing wound care, it's providers that have been doing home health that you know may may get more consideration, um, you know, over someone that has, you know, two months of experience and, you know, that maybe hasn't seen, didn't do any wound care in their RN days or something like that, right? But having a recruiter that's thorough, okay, that's going to that's gonna let you know, hey, for me, that knows the, the business, that knows how to get you seen by the client, because our job, our main goal, what we can control, okay, is getting you to an interview. Okay, and you selling like your skills and selling like you know what, and then once you once you do that, once you sell you know your your qualities and how you'll be a good fit and be able to help that client out, we go on the back end and we handle the numbers piece to make it make sense for them and and pretty much paint the picture that hey, like I said, this provider is moldable. They just you know guy school not too long ago. They'll take that training and they'll apply it. You know, they won't try to do their own thing because they've learned it, you know, four years ago at XYZ facility or something like that. They're a lot more, more moldable, they're coachable, and, and, you know, with the personality, it'll be a great fit. And then, of course, newer grads, you, you, you have to expect that with your initial contract, okay, you're probably going to make, uh, you know, a little bit less than someone who has, like, you know, two years of experience. And then, which ties into what I said earlier about having a recruiter that's going to be thorough and work on asking about, okay, hey, you know, the provider, how did she do? Okay, like, a, you've been working there for three months. We get an evaluation for you. How is she doing? What are the patients saying? How do you guys like them? How are they getting along with the team? She's great. She's doing amazing. That's, a, that's great. Now, with, when contract renegotiation times come to ask for the extension, we bring up that evaluation. Well, good recruiters do, right? They bring that up. Well, hey, just so you know, she's very interested in the job, but she's a full-time locum. She has like, you know, three different agencies that she's working with that are offering X, Y, Z. So can we match that? Can we, you know? And most of the time, I always explain this to providers, the clients, they don't, it's not their favorite thing to do to go and interview and provider after a provider, credential and then it's a lot. that the personality <laughs> and the skills match. It's a lot. It's, actually, it's, it's a, a lot. lot. So when they find someone, when they have someone, yeah, absolutely. Credentialing is a nightmare for most of them, right? For for most clients and providers, filling out these paperwork, insurances, doing all that, right? So now when they're done doing all of that, they have to hope and pray that the personality matches that, you know, because on paper it looks good, but, you know, they don't know the personality. Someone can, you know, Throw throws a, a, a face on for an interview, and then you know three more. It's a whole different person, you know. So mm -hmm. they don't want to go back to that whole process. So you know, giving them a, 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 a you know a, a five dollar raise, a seven dollar raise, a three dollar raise, uh, you know, and then keep keep going, keep going, right? That's 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 the recruiter's job to keep saying that and and doing that for you. Right, and I want to piggyback off of that because. Like, I think people need to understand that their interview process is not the same as a staff nurse practitioner. Like, you go in, you're all su suited and tied up or whatever, wearing a nice dress, and you go in and you meet the person, the, the person that's interviewing you in person. Like, these people can have a need next week and need a provider because the provider is suddenly out of work or, or the staff provider is suddenly out of work or somebody is going into maternity leave. So our, like, the, the interview process, I, I 
hate, I dread interviews. Like, I do. But the interview process as a nurse, a locum nurse practitioner has been the best interviews I've ever had because it's 15 minutes sometimes even 10 minutes and what they want to know is your skills they have your resume they want to know if you can be able to do the work and what's your availability so it's like we're on and it's on the phone too so it's like you know you're on the phone you're talking da, 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 da. so they like you said they don't have no they don't have time to check out your personality that's something that happens over time and they actually see your skills like are, is this the same person I had the 15 minute interview with like and I didn't know about the evaluation part because I've been like pretty much working continuously. So like, that's good. That's actually something that's really, really good to know. Right. Right. No, that's the interview piece is, uh, yeah, it's a lot less nerve wracking than like you see them going in. I always tell my providers too when they're interviewing, especially for like some of the longer contracts, because when you're doing like, um, you know, urgent care for a, a big portion of time, especially if you're doing, um, you know, if you're doing per diem contracts where it's not like, you know, hey, three months full time or whatever the case may be, right? But a lot of times, they, like you said, Miss F, they want to know that, you know, like you can do a job and, you know, how you speak and how you sell yourself, right? How, you, how do you talk about yourself when you're doing these interviews? How do you, how do you relate, um, you know, the questions to your experience, all of that? some of the primary care jobs where you're doing family medicine for three to six months where you're going to be building a relationship with the patients, you know, personality comes into factor a little bit more on those scenarios, right? And I tell my providers that when you're doing a phone interview, they can't see your body language. They can't no. see, you know, any, um, you know, nonverbal cues. They can't see any of that. So it's very important to try and, and let them in to know mm -hmm. who you are a little bit, right? Because they have your resume. Right. They have a written presentation that your recruiter has written, right? That's highlighting your skills. So they know what you can do because if you're a right. good match for the job, the, the, the recruiter is going to write that, right? The recruiter is going to write that on the presentation and your CV is going to back that up. So they know clinically, you know, you're good and they're willing to interview you. But they want to know a little bit more about you, about, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, if you've been there before, you know, if you're interested in going, kind of finding out not only about the clinic, not only about the facility, but also about the town. What's there to do if I'm going to be there for six months, you know? Like, right, yeah. Guys, I've things, had that you know? before, so. So, yeah, so little, some of these deals definitely matter. If you've never been to California, you know, kind of uh, let, let that be known. You've always been interested. So making it a little bit more conversational rather than, um, you know, kind of a QA. and a Hey, are you excited? what experience do you have in, um, you know, seeing, seeing kids or seeing these patients? Well, you know, I did this with my last job and I'm okay with it. Boom. That's, that's question answered. Yes, you did. You know, uh, but elaborating about that. Yes. I, I've done it in my last job before. So, you know, I, I'm interested in it or anything like that. Right. I'm interested. I like it. I, you know, it's not, it's not something that I, I love doing, but you know, I, it's I like, like dating sports. for the first time. <laughs> it, right. You know, you're, you're, you're explaining, you're explaining, you, you got to explain things like, you know, yeah. Or yeah, I have a lot of doing it, you know, in the, in the, in the clinic that I see, this is the percentage of Pete's patients that I see. I see this, I yeah. see that, you know, parents can be a little bit difficult, but I know how to do compare just, or just leaving it as, yes, I've done it before and, I, and I'm okay with it. So two right. different mm -hmm. answers there, you know, they, they get to know a little, a little bit more about you when you, when you go into detail with these answers and then showing interest in, you know, the city that you're going, if it's, um, you know, if you're, taking an assignment that's out of state or something like that is also very important. Right. Um, yeah. But that's why, yeah, that's why we, just, we go I about, agree. Um, you know, the interview process. But I see some questions here. It's a lot of questions, so we're going to get to them. Um, one yeah, person that's, that's, that's wrote, are there any great contracts picking back up? <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, a lot. I get contracts in my e I get contracts in my email all the time. I'm like, I don't have time. I'm already on one right now. Like it's it's a lot and it's been picking up a lot, a lot since COVID as well. Yeah. For sure. Um, COVID contracts, you guys are gonna start I don't know if anyone on this live is doing COVID contracts right now, but they're gonna probably start going down because a lot more they clinics are. and a lot more 
places are, you know, getting the vaccines and they're just like implementing it now in the practice where it's not just one place doing it anymore. So those contracts are going to, um, you know, start going uh, down in, uh, you know, normal primary care, urgent care, internal medicine, you know, contracts are going to start picking back up. Absolutely. Right now, California is, is booming. New York is picking back up. Um, Washington State's picking back up. Uh, Texas is picking up. Uh, we got, what's it called? Um, Oregon, I've seen like uh, picking up a lot, but Oregon's a little bit harder state. Harder state. Uh, Michigan, a little bit. Uh, Midwest is a little bit hard. Excuse me, Midwest is a little bit hard, but um, you know, the coasts, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, those are picking up like, you know, slowly but surely. But the major cities, your Massachusetts, your, uh, well, that's a mass, your major, uh, you know, your New States. York, your Boston, and yeah, um, those, those major states that have a lot of, a um, lot of people in them really, um, and that are, that are super popular, I find, right? The, the Massachusetts, the New Yorks, the Californias. Uh, the, even Nevada, right? The Arizona's picking up too. So, uh, but yeah, a lot of places are a lot of places are picking up, and you guys are gonna start seeing a lot more recruiters reaching out. Hey, I have this, um, you know, client looking. So here are the job details. Let me know what you think and all that. And okay, let's get to these questions. Yeah, I see, Miss uh, Miss Haskin is over. We just answered hers. Somebody Her. wrote. Um, the one you're looking at which one? Uh, oh, can you take a day off nurse b uh, can you take a day off during the contract the what if the contract so, is during a scheduled vacation mm -hmm. uh, okay. can you take a day off during the contract or what if the contract is during a scheduled vacation so when a recruiter is calling you about a job or you let them know that you're interested in the job. Number one, uh, I would say, I would say, a definitely take a look at the days that were the days needed, right? Um, in in theory, your recruiter should ask you if you have any scheduled vacation so they can present it in the front end, right? Because one of the what can happen is that's not presented on the front end to the client, and then, um, you know. A week before you're in talking, you're letting them know, hey, next week I won't be on the schedule. That's mayhem, absolute mayhem, mm -hmm. and that can, you know, cause things to go, you know, very, very south very quickly. So your recruiter needs to ask you before, before they send you down for presentation, before they send your candidacy down, they need to ask you if you have any planned vacations. When they get the contract for you for them to send to you. They should also ask you, they should ask it again, hey, um, so again, I just want to make sure, you know, here are the details of your contract. This is when you're going to be working from this to that. You, there's no days that you need off. There's no plan vacations or none of that, right? And then you say, okay. Um, but as far as, you know, if you're contracted, to, uh, you know, for three months to, uh, you know, take a day off, that doesn't really happen, to be honest, um, you know, unless it was presented beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um. Yes. So yes, that's the answer to your question. It's just like travel nursing. Um. The same way as a travel RN. Do you need your own? Huh? Wow, do you need your own? Yeah. No. You do not. No, you do not. Well, for I'll say for for bar and associates, you do not. Uh, most major most major agencies are probably not going to have you. Uh. You know. You're not going to need your own malpractice insurance. We cover that for you, and most of them have a tail, um, so you, you'll be protected. Now, with some of the smaller agencies, of course, if you're, you know, if they haven't been in business for for long, just, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, a couple of guys that are, you know, get together that have the experience and are doing that, you should definitely need to ask. You know how long they've been doing this. How long the company? You know, research the company, see how credible they are. How long they've been in business, and definitely ask about the malpractice insurance. Mm -hmm. okay. You can also opt to get your own, um, but most of the big companies like Barn Associates, who he works with, whether it be Health Comp Health, um, those companies uh, usually provide you with malpractice insurance, and you should make sure it does too. Anyways. Um, 
In clinic in in primary care clinics, what compensation is expected for a fairly new MP? I think we spoke about uh, that earlier. So fairly new MP, yeah. It so depends on where what state MP, you're in too. Uh, what state you're in absolutely it depends like uh on the competition and they have to you know to get you the interview and get you consideration they're probably gonna go like uh you know i would say fair fair would probably be anywhere you know the lowest that you should uh you know they should most likely be going but again don't depending on what the client's working with but even then the least the least they i well i'm i won't speak for all the recruiters but the least that I typically go for is that $50 mark, 50 an hour mark. So, which uh, again, if you, you know, since you, there's no taxes being taken out, like, uh, you know, that's if you work a full year, uh, 40 hours, essentially that should land you about, you know, uh, uh, you know, a hundred thousand to uh, 102, maybe depending if you, a uh, couple of weeks, you work a little bit over 40 hours, but Typically, I would say the, the least I usually tell new grads that I'm going to get look to get for them is that $50, $50 an hour uh, compensation. So, Yeah, that's from a recruiter standpoint. From my standpoint, 80 and over. <laughs> you know, I always say that. Of course, of Don't course. play. Of course, but of course. It all, no, of again, course. It's it always all... like that, right? It, it's always, right. yeah. It's, it's always going to be like that, you know? But uh, again, the biggest thing, though, the biggest, biggest thing that you guys should be looking for, though, is it shouldn't stay like that, right? If you yeah. go in at 50, because you need to, like, your next contract, if you if they want to bring you back, that means you're doing something right. If you're doing something right, you know, they, your recruiter should look to, you know, to get you more. To make sure you stay happy, of course you're working. And again, the whole point of doing locums is to to make a little bit more, right? Now, mm -hmm. the, again, I will say it again. It also depends on the contract. But again, um, you know, talking to that with the recruiter, the recruiter being open with you and and talking to you and setting up that game plan on how you're gonna make more. That's how you find. That's how you see where your recruiter is good. If you stay, you know, for year one, you're making the same. Year two, you're making the same. Change that recruiter. Call me. Mm -hmm. And that also goes to um, um, the next question, which I have put up here because I try to like keep it a little bit organized. Um, mm -hmm. Do you get the same perks as a travel RN, like housing or stipend assignments and longer? So like, also like some contracts that I've seen, it's just like, it might be lesser of a pay, but they provide full benefits like housing. And um, we don't have stipends as a travel nurse practitioner. We just get paid our hourly. In addition to it, we get housing or we can get mileage recovered for every day that we go to work and also rental as well. So that also depends on the clinic um, and what they're willing to compensate. Absolutely. So you can always opt Absolutely. out and be like, I don't need like I don't need housing. Like I remember there was a company that was like, Hey, you're in New York, we wanna work we wanna work with you for so and so, we'll provide you housing. I was like, No, I don't need housing. I need you to increase my pay because I have housing already. I live in New York City, so I don't need your housing. But then there might be right. some contracts where I'll pick up and it's like maybe in West Bubba Fuck and I'm like, Okay, well, I'd rather you I'd rather you provide me with housing because I don't wanna be looking for that. I don't even know the neighborhood or something like that. So it all depends as well. Um so yeah, no stipend. We don't have that um stipend. We just get paid how hourly in addition to whatever the the clinic is willing to provide for us. And that's like right. rental, mileage and housing. Right. And I'll say even even uh, you know, to add quickly a little bit more to that. Um, most of the time when it's a six month assignment plus most companies, well, I know Barton does what they do is they spend the first two weeks you'll spend in a hotel nearby uh, of uh, the clinic or the hospital that you're going to work at. And then you're working with a travel team because we have a very, very good travel team here at Barton where they work with you to to, to look at getting you a lease, a fully furnished apartment or uh, you know, the VRBOs where you get to, you know, have your own kitchen, cook your own meals and, you know, 
have it be better than just uh, getting a, a, a you know a continental breakfast or something like that. Or maybe you can do like a bed and breakfast where it's a little bit more cozy, um, you know, rather than a hotel. But typically that's for longer term assignments and your recruiter should go into, you know, how that works and, and, and all of that. Uh, and on the long term, it's better for the clients as well than paying, you know, seven days at a hotel for six months rather than being a monthly, um, you know, paying a monthly lease and all of that. So that's the what happens yeah like Ms. Ebony said most stipends right. hourly rate and um, you know you'll get your your expenses covered and if they don't cover expenses your recruiter should tell you that and kind of look to break down the, the numbers to do like an all-inclusive rate is what we call it where you know you, you add some of that um, you know on the hourly rate so you, you'll get that and then really quickly with your accountant you should have an if you're doing locum suit you should have an accountant that you go to you know, to handle that because they, on 1099 contracts, as everyone knows, we don't take out taxes. You have to handle that. But again, you get to write off all these things if you pay for them or, you know, if the client doesn't offer that, you know, you write off your mileage, you write off your, you know, uh, the, the place that, you know, wherever you stay at, uh, you get to write that off. Mm -hmm. So the live ends, I think, in like one minute. I don't know. There was a few more questions. I don't know if you had like, 30 minutes or not? Um, yeah, yeah, I'll go. Let's go. Let's, All right. Let's, let's, uh, so just in yeah. case it ends, we will hop back on for at least 30, right. at least 30 minutes to answer the rest of you guys' questions. Um, somebody put, do resident programs count as experience? Um, programs. No, that, as far as I know, it doesn't count as experience. No, it I doesn't. I don't know if you have a... No, okay. um, cl clinicals, Clinicals, um, they don't count as, you know, they don't always count as experience as good. Like, you know, if the provider's been trained in something to mention it, like, you know, as training, but not, um, you know, working experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, let's see here. Somebody, hold on, let me, let me pull it up. Here we go. Here's a good one. Well, do you see a lot of psych NP locum opportunities? Um, so I'm not I'm not specialized in psych, but we do have a psych department, and we have been seeing um, you know psych NPs. I know for PA, it's a smaller market where it's a lot harder for them to get opportunities in the psych world. But psych NPs, yes, we there's there's a market for that. Yeah, so I I remember when I first started, I went to um, locumtenants.com. Um, it's like Indeed. And when I was looking at the opportunities there, I seen a lot of psych positions there. I could tag that in there if people were interested in that. Um, but it's it's a pretty cool, a cool market. I don't know any locums that work in psych per se, but I did see like the opportunities on there. And it varies with every opportunity to state by state as well. Right. Um, okay, so let me see. It looks like it's not going off. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. So somebody had wrote, uh, and we spoke about this already, so I'm going to skip that. It was about compensation and hourly rate. We spoke about that as far as like the hourly, hourly rate varies in state to state and with compensation as far as housing and travel stuff like that and if you guys have any questions you could also drop it down inside the box or in the chat we're looking through that as well um somebody wrote are you able to earn a minimum of six figures annually as a travel np on average how much of your time is spent working as a travel np to earn that amount so that i can leisure travel more but still maintain a six-figure income uh, that's a very good question, and I did look at that a little bit earlier, and, and yes, you are. Um, again, it depends on what your hourly rate, of course, is and how much you're willing to, uh, you know, willing to work. But for the most part, yes, a lot of a lot of MPs that do locums, like, you know, clear 100000 um, you know, a year pretty easily, actually, like, um, and, um, you know, so now, it, again, it depends on how you set your schedule up. Okay, if you want to work, you know, for the most part, if you're making a salary of like, you know, um, 70, 75, you know, from in, in nine to in nine to 10 months, you should hit like, uh, you know, 100,000. 
And uh, I mean, again, depends on the market that you're in, the setting that you work in, and you know, and all of that. But you should, if you want to work straight out to nine to ten months, and then take a, a month off, and then you know, um, or take two months off, and be able to still like uh, clear that number that you're you're looking for, you you are able to do that. It's just making sure mm-hmm. that you have a recruiter that's gonna have things lined up for you. Uh, you know, in a continuous way where, you know, you're able to take the time off and know that there's going to be a, a contract, okay, waiting for you and all that. And the only way you can do that is JIC licenses. Must mm-hmm. get you I was just about to say if that. you're going to be a local. You have in to. The big, definitely in the big space as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm oh, licensed. Yeah, for well. sure. We're working on our cat. We're working on the Cali license. I'm licensed in New York. I'm already like I don't think I told you I'm licensed in DC. I'm licensed in DC. Um, Chicago. I'm working on. So like basically the bigger states, Washington. I'm working on as well. Getting licensed right, in right. those bigger states will put you more on a higher end than those that are like it's really it really comes down to flexibility. Like your flexibility yeah. in your schedule your flexibility in going places, um, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. So in order to pull six figures, it really depends on you because there's times where, like me, I have side jobs as well. You know what I mean? I still continuously work as a remote nurse practitioner. On top of that, I pick up locum tenens assignment, but I know that my continuous, like that's not going to go anywhere. You know what I mean? On top of that, I do travel influence and stuff. So, I would be a bad example for you per se, but for a person that actually, um, this is all they do. They just work locum tenens and I'm trying to figure out how to still make the six figures. You have to make sure you're flexible with your license and you have to make sure you're flexible with your schedule. Absolutely. I, yeah, I mm-hmm. agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And get a good recruiter that can help you out. That's, that's almost yes. like half the battle. You need you yeah. need a good recruiter. You absolutely do. Um, definitely. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, another thing that I want to say when it comes to finances as a locum tenant, yes, there are some contracts that are W twos. They're like contracts. Sorry, cubby, uh, companies that are W two, and there are companies that are still ten ninety nine. And just having like a great CPA, somebody that knows how your finances work, because. If you're paying for home, if you're paying for housing, you want to make sure that's a write off, like you said. If you're paying for a rental, you want to make sure that's a write off. Where some contracts, they might just come, they might just provide you with that. That doesn't count as a write off for your taxes. So right. basically, somebody that actually you keep up with your own stuff, and somebody that actually helps you and keeps up with your stuff as well. And having a good financial advisor because that goes to like the benefits. There are companies that do have the whole 401k and all of that extra stuff. And um, as if you're a staff nurse practitioner, and then you have other companies that it's like, you have to do it on your own. So me personally, this is my personal uh, um, thing when it comes to finances, I have a financial advisor. I would, even if you are not a locum, you should always have a financial advisor. Anyways, I have a finance financial advisor that still, make sure that I am still ha- I still have my retirement plan. I still have my life insurance, my disability, my health insurance and stuff like that. And it aligns with um, me still making that six figure income in addition to paying for um, what I need to pay for. And you get, you can write stuff off on your taxes as well. So yeah. Um, let me see. Some of these questions are repetitive. We already spoke about experiences. Um, who do you use for travel NP jobs? I do use Barton Associates for travel NP, but I've worked with other companies as well um, for travel NP jobs. Um, are there contracts available for all specialties? Um, for most specialties, yes. Now, some specialties are, uh, you know, more popular than others. Again, um, if you are not, so I'll say for, uh, you know, some of the people that are in this uh, live, if you are a specialty, you know, anything cardiology, ICU, or, you know, um, urology, any, any, any specialty, um, 
if you do reach out, I, you know, we have a specialty group here that, you know, I can, I can uh, put you in contact with one of the greats over there in the specialty group that can, you know, give you all the details. And I don't want to, you know, since that's not what I specialize in, um, I don't want to speak on it, you know, for some of the more uh, specialized stuff, you know, some, some of the, you know, for example, ENTs and, you know, uh, some, of, some of these specialties that we might not see, like uh, feeds ER or nephrology or something like that. Like, uh, you might want to talk to one of the, one of my recruiters in a specialty group to see, like, okay, well, what are my chances of actually getting a contract and, and whatnot, right? So if you do, want, if you are a specialist of any kind, I, as either an MP or a PA, and you want to know what the market for you is looking like, uh, you know, it's free consults. <laughs> I can, uh, I can have one of my one of my guys in specialty, you know, uh, set you up with an appointment with them, and they can go over what you can expect and how many clients they have, and uh, that way you can see if it's something that's worth it for you. But I'm assuming that's, that's that one of your, answer. I'm assuming that's one of your clients. <laughs> Uh, Cyril, well, one of your best recruiters. He said one of the best recruiters. <laughs> oh, that's that's man. Shout out! I say that. Shout out to 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 Jay Wall. On there. It's Jordan Wall. That's one of my. That's the arguably the best account manager, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. the, the account managers they don't they don't they don't they deal with the client and the you know client side, and you know recruiters would deal with the providers. So me and him, we work very very well together. Uh, and he's one of those guys that's flexible, right? That understand how things are and very, very hard worker. And uh, mm -hmm. that's one of my best friends out there. So, you know, big shout out to Jay Wall if you're still here. Um, oh, that's what, Amber too. Shout out to Amber. Amber. Oh, that's Amber. It is. She's a, she's a very good recruiter too. And she's doing it. That's, that's one of my, that's one of the people where, you know, I started with and, She's very, very good at what she does. Jordan did write that too. Uh, but yeah, Amber, she's very good at what she does. So shout out to her as well. Oh, Work I like that next one. I skills. hope you yes. will recruit me soon and work on future and wounds care. I don't, you don't oh, have to be will. a wound care provider, y'all. <laughs> do I have my future? Uh, I bring that thing with me all the time. I think work I have on that. that. Work on that. I do. Work on that. I have it. I bring that thing with me yeah. all the time because I always Good. practice my suture because that's one of the easiest skills that you can lose. And I always right. encourage people, like, even if you're a primary care provider, because I actually have one friend that was a primary care provider um, that actually got into urgent care because she started practicing, like, her, like suturing. And then so she said yeah. she knew how to suture. Absolutely. Yeah, she's pretty that's, good at that's, one of the, that's one of the, you know, one of the things that I always tell providers because you can, with the urgent care, okay, a lot of clients do per DM contracts. You can always pick up a shift here and there, you know, do a 12 hour shift, you know, make that extra money. Now with the suturing, okay, I do want to say that too. It's not like every time you work, you're probably going to have like, you're going to have a, a, a suturing case. Most of the time it's acute care stuff, right? Uh, that you're seeing, but it's important to have that skill in case something does walk in through the door. So mm -hmm. that way you know, they don't have to send that out to the ER if you can take care of it. So that's where, mm -hmm. you know, that skill does come through. And uh, I always let them know, grab a kit, do a class. Even if you haven't done it on a live patient, definitely get used to that skill, get used to doing it, um, you know, and, and have that in your back pocket because right, it, it right. will be helpful. Right, right, right. And it's kind of fun. Like when you're like, oh, I got a suture case because you really get it. It's right. like, oh my God, I got a suture case. Let's get it. Like, so um, somebody had, somebody had asked earlier and I didn't know, I actually, I didn't send you the question, but somebody had asked earlier and I don't, I didn't know the answer, but it's about aesthetics NP. Like, do they have that as a locum? You know, the whole Botox fillers. I didn't, um, yeah, so some dermatology cases, absolutely. Um, some in that are specialized in that. In my company, we don't see too much of Botox and, uh, you know, aesthetics. But uh, some dermatology and aesthetic clients do look for it. It's not as popular as urgent care or primary care or even like, um, you know, your other specialties. But it is it, it is out there. Um, so mm -hmm. I would say 
with that, you probably do have to look a little bit more, you know, being honest with you, because it's not a very popular, um, you know, uh, thing that we do see out there uh, for, for on the locum world. But I would still um, talk to people, talk to recruiters, you know, talk to them, ask them, you know, questions, because you'll probably... You will get a call from from a recruiter at some point if you're a provider. One way or another, you yeah, will you're get gonna a call. get a call regardless. <laughs> yeah, you're you're gonna get a call. You know, like uh, they'll find you. Um, you know, but it's it's always a good thing, though. I always say that it's always a good thing to have a recruiter in your back pocket, even if you're not looking for Working, it right now. Right. Yeah. You never know what can happen. You never know. Life happened fast. And you want to be able to have someone that has, you know, your CV on file that has like, you know, your thing, like just in case of a rainy day, or maybe they might bring around like a really good opportunity that you didn't think that you wanted or, you know, that you were interested in. And it doesn't, it doesn't hurt, you know, because when we're calling, essentially we're looking to make you money and, you know, make a little money to ourselves. So it's always a good thing to have, you know, that in your back pocket. Right. And like uh, me, I always, yeah, me, I always like, I, as much as I travel, I travel a lot. I always tell you still to look for opportunities for me because I could pick, I could come back from Costa Rica and pick up a contract next week. So I always want those opportunities sent to me. I don't care if I'm working now or not working. Like I still want it sent to me because I'm not the type of person that be out, that like to be out of, uh, out of work for so long. So if right. we have a next lineup, like, okay, because somebody had asked that question, like, what, like as far as, like, the job market with and with um with travel MPs, if you are proactive and you have a recruiter that's proactive, you should not be out of um, a contract. You should not be out of work. And that was something that I had to learn prior to, like, actually, when you had, um, when you had called me. And I was like, yeah, this person said that they were going to help me with my licenses. And you were like, uh, remember that? <laughs> like, yeah, so, yeah, I know for sure. I remember. Yeah. And then you got my, you got my ducks in a row. I got my emergency New Jersey license and so on. So you have to be as proactive as your recruiter as well. Because I know you spoke a lot about recru- how, how the recruiter has to be. But you have to be the same way as well. If you are that person that um wants to have a consistent position whether it's like an urgent care or primary care or dermatology or whatever specialty that you have experience in you have to be equally as proactive there's sometimes where i'm not proactive i'm not even gonna lie because i'm like yeah this month i just want to travel so but i still would still get the opportunities flowing in my email should i decide like "Eh, i don't want to do this no more so that's something that you definitely need to know what are opportunities Absolutely. for psych NP and I mean, what about opportunities for psych NP, which we spoke earlier, or do you see a lot of women's health contracts? These are all questions for you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah so, so for me, yeah, absolutely. So with the women's health, it's a little bit, uh, you know, we do see contracts, but not a lot. Okay, mm-hmm. and uh, for even like uh, so, even with those states. You, we, I would have to like, um, you know, pretty much do a, a search, like, you know, really targeting that and see like which clients hire for those because sometimes there are different contracts. Sometimes it might hire someone, you know, or I, or I might see a, a, a job post for a woman's health provider, mm-hmm. but that's because they need a vacation coverage covered for three months. Right now, that's not a client. Most likely that's going to, you know, it's not a revolving door where they're going to keep hiring and keep hiring for this position. So, yeah. um, you know, because I used to work with, um, you know, I, I used to work with a woman's health, uh, you know, nurse practitioner in California. And unfortunately, you know, I, I wasn't seeing any, um, you know, clients that were, like I said, the revolving door and also to she couldn't travel out of state. And, you know, I had to unfortunately, uh, you know, tell her, you know, um, or, you know, really speak to her and be like, look, I, I really feel like maybe, you know, maybe local, local agencies, uh, you know, that have like, right. um, maybe some, because she was placed by a local agency. I was like, maybe that's your best bet. Because if you're, you know, if you have not willing to travel where, and I think like New York, New York, actually, we do see, um, 
we do see a little bit more women's health uh, jobs, OB uh, I do. Jobs. I see them in like um, the federally qualified yeah. clinics. I did see like a Planned Parenthood yep, yep. need. So yeah, like it goes yeah. back to what we were saying earlier, it, the it's, flexibility it's with that, state, with yeah. her, with her, she wasn't as flexible. She just wanted to be in California right. with her kids and stuff like that. So it goes back to flexibility and all of that stuff. That's how you find right. the opportunities and stuff like that and being proactive. So that's definitely a good, and I also seen an employee health one too, like employee health, like just strictly just doing women's health. So there are opportunities out there as well. Um, so you just got to look for it. So uh, Layla, Layla said she missed, uh, you know, the psych MP part. So I'm just going to do a quick recap of that before we, uh, you know, look at uh, the question about that for the PA. So MPs, we do see opportunities for psych MPs. Uh, like I said, I personally, I work, uh, you know, in primary care. So if you are interested in, uh, in psych as an MP, Again, uh, you know, experience will matter, but I can put you in contact with one of my colleagues that specializes in psych, um, you know, that will be able to help you out. But again, like Ms. Ebony has been saying, and I have been saying, you have to be proactive into, you know, getting licenses and be open to licenses and be flexible to, you know, taking a contract. Uh, maybe that's outside of your state where, you and, know, it's one of our, our, our best states. For, and since for, we're talking uh, about... Since we're talking about licenses, before we get to the pension plan um, one, because that's been up for a minute, um, explain, like, the licenses, like, with your company. And you guys got to remember that this is, like, this is his, the, he works for Barton Associates. So because they might not have women's health doesn't mean another company doesn't. You still want to apply for as much I companies as you want to, as you have to, just to expand your opportunities. So just to keep that in the back of your mind as well. It's not a company to not go with because they get opportunities that ding them in as much as, as, as often, you know, and then they send the opportunities to uh, act a proactive recruiter will send that opportunity to you as well. So um, I wanted to speak more about like, this is a common question I get about licenses and licensures. Um, and we could also ask, um, um, talk about the compact license which she's, she's, she's talking about as well like how does okay. the process with um licenses work so um with licenses depending on your company right before uh you know they'll have like different ones for you before before barton associates we have two um we have two agreements so to kind of like uh you know be be to the point so the two agreements one of them it's you pay for the license. We do all, well in both in both um, agreements. We'll do all the work and follow up with the boards because our licensing team they have people at the boards, right? And they get paid to follow up with those people and work with those people to get the license uh, pushed as fast as possible. Whereas you know you're working, you got stuff going on to be following up with the board is a nightmare. Oh so either I, I either way. It. <laughs> right, right. Most most providers do. And, uh, you know, that's why we're like, look, have let me take care of it. Let, let our team take care of it because that's what they get paid for. We have a licensing team solely. Their whole job is for license purposes, right, and credentialing. So um, the first agreement is you pay for it. Once you get the license, it's yours. You can, you know, of course, you can work with anyone, any other agencies and whatnot. Once you take a job with Barton Associates and you work 30 days, it doesn't have to be consecutive. As soon as you work that 30 day mark, okay, you stay, you keep your receipts and all that, all the licensing fees, you send it to your recruiter, the recruiter sends it to finance, you get reimbursed for that. Okay, once you work your 30 days. So that's a 30 day agreement. The other one is the one-year agreement where we pay for it, okay? And but for that one-year agreement that the license is active for, you can only work or take locum contracts with Barton Associates, mm -hmm. okay? So the, cab the caveat with that, right, is um, or if you do take a job with a different agency, you have to, like, reimburse Barton Associates for those fees of the license, Okay, so either way, um, I typically uh, prefer my providers to do the 30-day one 
especially if it's a state where I know yeah. I have work for them. But also, too, I, I don't like, like, you know, restricting or limiting providers to only work with uh, me because of, you know, how, like I said, how I work is, like, I really care about them and I want them to have as many people looking for work for them, you know, as possible. It's okay. I know I'm going to be the favorite one. I already know it. <laughs> but you know, uh, I don't want them to, you know, limit themselves. And of course, it creates competition. I like to compete. I like to know, you know, I like to know that I'm the favorite. I like to work to get to that. Okay. And, uh, you know, you should, if you're doing locums, you want as many people, you know, you, you want as many people calling you for jobs. And I'd be know. like, damn, like, hold on, chill. <laughs> That's right. how I feel. I'm like, yeah, I'll, all right, give me a minute. Let me process this. I got this company that's calling me, like, it really is a lot of work for you, like, out there. Like, it really is. Right. And I be trying to tell people that. Right. No, it is. But, it's um, a lot. You know, a lot of the, the, a lot of the recruiters, right. Work with me too, it's, not serious. it's not a good recruiter. Because, yeah, that's not a good. These, no, some of these companies, not. some of these companies, because some of these recruiters follow me on Instagram. So some of these companies, they'd be like, hey, Ebony, I don't know if you're on vacation, but um, we have an opportunity. I'd be like, I'm like, all right, what is it about? Okay, like, they're like, I know you need vacation time. So we we can give you vacation time with this clinic. I'm like, okay, then we can, that, that kind of steers me in the right direction. Like, you right, know, so right. um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty dope. I love it. I love it. Okay. Right. It's good. You know, keep your options open. And like I said, but you know, we, we will, we will find you great opportunities. So the compact license, that's very important as well. Mm -hmm. So with the compact license, what that does is it shorten your time, the uh, nurse practitioner license dramatically, because if you have a compact license in a compact state, you don't have to apply. Well, when you're so applying right. for the NP license, you don't need to get, um, it doesn't take the same time frame for you to get your RN license. It just, it goes straight to, uh, excuse me, the process to get your NP license. So for example, uh, you know, I think Florida or so I think one of the Carolinas or I know for sure Maryland, um, I'm pretty sure, well, I don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure Maryland is a compact state. So one of, one of my providers was applying for the license. She had the compact already from Georgia, I believe. Um, and she got that license in a, in a way quicker time frame as if, you know, someone else that doesn't have that compact license. Because I take, that can take a couple months, right? That can take a couple months, and, and it can be also a pain about waiting for it when you know there's opportunities and whatnot. But the compact license helps a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, credentialing also. Credentialing is something that happens fast. Like, fastest I've ever seen credentialing. Like, <laughs> for, it's crazy. With the compact? No, for NPs, just the credentialing part for these jobs. Because people, some yeah, people yeah, were asking true. me, some people were asking me, like, oh, like, because as a staff nurse practitioner, um, I remember waiting a couple of months for credentialing. Like, it took forever. But as an NP, like a travel NP, if the client wants you by, if, if the company wants you by next week, they're going to make sure that they get credentialing done in one day. And it's a yeah. lie. It's like, and that's why, like, as that's why I said with being proactive as the travel MP, you want to make sure that look, you you have all your ducks in a row to be ready because there's all of my stuff is up to date. My physical, my ACLS, mm -hmm. my BLS, my t my tuberculosis, everything, everything is up to date. I try, me personally, I try to get that. I try to get those stuff done while I'm in the clinic that I'm working in because it's not like I got to make an appointment or something like that. It's just like, hey, right, look, right. take my blood because I know for my next contract, I'm going to need it. I'm like almost due for it. But right. So that's what I right. personally do because I want to make sure that everything is all my ducks is in a row. So if I get that good opportunity that's willing to pay me and want me to start tomorrow, I could creden I could send them all my stuff for credentialing today because it happens really fast. Absolutely. Um, Being proactive with that helps a lot. You know, we have uh, at Barton, most, I don't know about the other big companies, but a lot, you know, with at Barton, we have a credentialing team. Once you get the assignment, that's going to reach out to you and say, hey, uh, you know, they reach out to the facilities credentialing uh, member, and they re also reach out to the provider. So like that, they can get that credentialing thing done quick because mm -hmm. a lot of times that we, we, you know, speed is our proposition, right? Is, is that's what we 
a lot of times these facilities need a provider like to start in two weeks or, you know, in um, three weeks or whatever the case may be, right? So mm -hmm. we, Martin takes that into consideration. We have the licensing team and, you know, I mean, the, sorry, the credentialing team that's going to reach out to you and tell you, hey, this is what you need. This is what you need. This is what you need. Right. I remember. Forget, Miss Ebony, yeah. Uh, before we forget, I do want to take, uh, you know, the PA question. But yes, we do see oh, yeah. contracts for PAs as well. Uh, it's up, oh, it's up a little bit exactly, more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We do see contracts for PAs as well. Um, now, you know, depending on the state, of course, but I will always say California and New York, you know, best, best bet right there, California and New York. Uh, you, you'll always have opportunities out there for, for MPs and PAs. Uh, you know, these days you, we are seeing uh, a little bit of a decrease in opportunities for PAs. I do want to say that too, of course, um, because of the supervisory position where a lot of more states are kind of opening up to MPs if they work a certain number of, of hours that they can practice independently without the supervising position. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still state to state. And there's still a lot of travel opportunities for, for PAs, especially mm -hmm. if you're in a primary care. Um, but yeah, it goes by specialties as well. Definitely yeah. goes by specialties. So if you want to get with me after, uh, we got Bookie's blog. You know, depending on your specialty, you know, I can help you out or, um, you know, send you over to, you know, one of my special specialists and in, um, or psych, if you do psych, or whatever, whatever you're in, you do whatever you specialize in. You know, let me know, and I can direct you to the right person. If I personally cannot help you, right, 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 right. I was, I was just saying that. Um, I remember that, like, I you told me about like an opportunity the next day, and we got credentialed in one day. <laughs> I was just yeah. thinking about that. So yeah. it's like when I it say that, the, when I say it happens really fast, like. Just make sure that you're on top of your game with everything you need, your licenses and everything. Have a file folder if you need it. There it is. Have a file folder. And also, your recruiter should keep one for you as well. So mm -hmm. whenever, you know, if whenever a credential is reaching out to my providers, I always tell my providers to CC me on the emails where they're sending stuff so I can put that on their folders as well. So like that when, uh, you know, if it's a new assignment with someone else, like uh, I can have all that in the folder and just send that to the credentialer right away. Right. Yeah. So, so you have somebody that says she's dual certified. I also have an FMP with ED and uh, she's like your ideal client, like. <laughs> right, right, right. so definitely you guys Let's if you see. I have the recruiter it took months because I didn't have availability neither did he but like slide in his DM like you know Absolutely. he's definitely very 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 available um somebody have wrote Absolutely. um is there a pension plan offered is there a pension plan offered with Barton pension plan no not that maybe it should add that but no as of right now um you know no pension plan uh it's more you know it's more like it's an hourly rate a lot of opportunities and a lot of times the clients will pay for your expenses so i usually tell my providers this is like you know this is your time to cash out you know like i'll get that we'll get the expenses taken care of you know and um uh, make your you know make your money and cash out and uh, probably more so we try to get into like have like a financial, um, you know, advisor. I always push mm -hmm. that as well, you know, for, so they can handle those for you because uh, a lot of agencies don't do that. I know Barn doesn't, but uh, what, what they do, what we do is uh, making sure, you know, you stay employed and um, we're proactive about that. Right. So I wanted to say that, um, when it comes to those kind of things, you have to outweigh the risk and the benefits for yourself. Um, there are people that I know personally that still work their full-time job, you know, for their benefits, um, but also would pick up locum work because you have those opportunities where it's like, hey, we need, you, and you even send me some opportunities, like we need a client in this, in this, um, this field uh, that specializes in whatever field, like for me, urgent care, primary care, that needs a provider on this date, this date, this date, this date, and this date. So now if your job, if your normal job works, like if your normal job is nine to five, Monday to Friday, and he sends you a position that's like, hey, we need a provider on Sunday, 
that's your extra income. You know what I'm right. trying to say? Because you only work Monday to Friday, or maybe you work twice, two um, two shifts a week, two twelve hour or three twelve hour shifts a week, and those dates that you have off, those dates that he has sent you or the recruiter has sent you are available. You can also pick up locum work that way, so you don't have to be a full time um, locum tenens provider like I am. You know what right, I mean? Right. Um, I also, like I said, I also do other stuff other than nursing. So that's why I, it's just, it just works for me. The flexibility works for me. Um, there's months where I work consistently, you know, six months, seven months, and then maybe take off like a month to do my traveling stuff or, you know, so it, it you have to evaluate what works for you. And right. because of that reason, because I work with companies that um, are for a shorter amount of time because of what I do as a different line of work, I chose personally to opt into my financial advisor, which, I, like I said, I encourage everybody to get a financial advisor, whether you work as a staff or not. That's just one thing that should be high on your bucket list. But I have a financial advisor that makes sure that I still receive the benefits that I need to receive if I was still working as a staff nurse practitioner, uh, as a staff nurse practitioner. So it's pretty much like being an entrepreneur and uh, like a business owner as well. You, you know, business owners are not just like, you know, just making it, they are making their money, but they're, they make it sure they're aligned up for their future as well. So that's the stuff that you have to look into as well. Um, that's the stuff that I hope to talk more about on my other page as well. So I know I've been slipping, but yeah. <laughs> and I will say too, on that, on the, so providers, a lot of, a lot of providers have their own business as well. Uh, you know, always look to see if you can get, you know, paid under the LLC. Cause I know. Yeah. That, that's what I meant to say. You know, yeah. yeah. That's also, yeah. Very, very important too. Um, you know, as mm -hmm. far as like tax purposes and all that. And, you know, we, we, we can help with that. We can, there's ways to, so you get like, uh, you know, paid under your LLC rather than your personal bank. So like that, you know, um, and if you have a financial advisor or if you know about that, um, you know, the, you know, the pros on that and the benefits of doing that. So do not be shy to ask about that and see if that can, that can happen. So, cause right, it's, yeah. it's an easy, yeah, it, it's, it's that's, not, it's not hard at all uh, to right. do. So definitely look into that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's the thing that I think I slipped up on my first year. And after that, I was like, okay, now I'm now I, now I am an LLC and now everything is being under my LLC. Um, like I said, LLC. it's not a lot of information out there with travel and peace. So it was mm -hmm. just like, it was just like, for me, when I first started, it was just like, oh my God, the freedom, the flexibility, but I was not, I didn't have a financial advisor at first. I didn't have a good CPA at first. I didn't know anything about having companies pay for my licenses and um, licenses and then like, you know, getting reimbursed. You told me about the license stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought I was going to have to come out my pocket for everything. Like, right, right, you know right, what I mean? Right. So. That was how it was, like, at least my first year, that I mean, less than a year, before I actually sat down and was like, let me do my research. So my goal is to, like, educate people on on this because there's not much research out there. Every time I tell somebody I'm a travel nurse practitioner, they're like, you could travel as an NP? Yes, right, you can. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's very important. And it's also, too, like, in the other part about it too where I feel like um, you know people that are interested or intrigued about it you know should like um, should, should hear about it because I tell people right it's, it's not it may not be for you which is all right you know it may not be depending on your personal situation you know but if there is something you can do like Miss Ebony said you don't have to be a full-time traveling one depending on where you're at, at you might find part-time work you might find per diem work you know, um, so kind of exploring all these options. Um, and, you know, like you said, I think we're something like this, Miss Abs will probably should do it like, uh, you know, once every couple of months or something like that for, mm -hmm. you know, for new people, you know, to ask, uh, you know, questions. And because again, I from will. your side, yeah, you know, and I, I'm down for it too, from your side and my side, we're able to educate and, um, you know, show options and, and different perspectives that, you know, if the research is not out there, where they can, you know, where they can do that and they can access that information. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. Exactly. So was there any, somebody said, so if you have an EIN, it would be better to use it. Yes. Rather than your social security number. Yes. Yep. It would definitely be better to use it because you can write off, um, you can write off off a whole bunch of stuff under your business. Like even me traveling, like with my remote, uh, my remote nurse practitioner position, I'm bringing my laptop to work. I'm bringing my laptop with me while I'm traveling. I can write off my travel expenses because I needed a place to stay. Like, for example, if I had, uh, if I, um, have an Airbnb that I'm staying at overseas, I needed to use the Wi-Fi. I'm on vacation, but I'm working on vacation. So I can still write off that Airbnb that I paid for because of the simple fact that I'm still showing proof that I'm doing my remote nurse practitioner work, but I'm overseas have, enjoying myself. So y'all only see like the vacation, the pictures, but I really do be working in these streets. She be working. Really she be do. working. <laughs> be working in these know. streets because I am not going vacation without it being paid for you know via taxes so yes like yeah it's it's definitely possible so yeah definitely use get that llc um and use your ein number Mm -hmm. over your social security that was what i did wrong the first time and ended up owing a lot in taxes right so Um, definitely definitely important Um, right um somebody wrote somebody said um, what kind of assignments do you usually get as a travel MP? I can answer this question. Or you can. Have you have you or anyone you know ever got a horrible assignment? What's your advice if this was to happen? We spoke about this a little bit earlier, though. Like, so the assignments that I usually get are assignments that's relatable to what I do and what I have training in. So I I have um. I have urgent care experience. I have primary care experience. Those are my basic, uh, basic experience. Now I develop primary care experience as a locum. I never had it as a baseline. My baseline is urgent care. So it was like I said, a blessing for me to get a primary care position after four months of working as a nurse practitioner in general. So it all depends on the amount of experience that you have in the certain, uh, the certain, uh, uh, realm of things and stuff like that. Yeah, so okay. in prime, yeah, the certain field. So with that primary experience that I had, also like, so even though you do primary care, right? There's some things that you can do in primary care over other things that you could do in primary care. And this is what I mean in um in that sense. So even though I was in primary care, I had I worked in a federally qualified clinic, so I had experience as an HIV specialist, right? I have experience as an infectious uh, infectious disease specialist as well. I was going to do suboxone um, suboxone um, treatment training as well, but I never did that. But like, so I have sure. primary care. I know I know I should. I have primary care as my umbrella, but within that six months, I had developed all these different types of experience. So should Max have sent me an opportunity, like, hey, we need an HIV specialist? I have experience as a provider with HIV. So now I can hop on that opportunity because of the simple fact that within my primary care umbrella, I had developed all these different experiences, if that makes sense. So, yes. So you're- I'll speak really quick. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, no, just to sum it up, like your opportunities continue to grow as a travel MP. Like your, your experiences continue to grow as a travel MP. And so for somebody like me that came out of graduating and did not know what the hell I wanted to do, choosing this path for me worked for me because of the simple fact that I have so much experience in different, different realm of things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's great. And that's, that's a, as, a, as a recruiter, we want that too because we're going to let the client know this. She can do this. She, can, she has done this. She's done this. She's done this. She's comfortable with this. She's currently doing this. And, you know, uh, it's this. This is why she's a great provider, and of course, with that too, you know, uh, the more experience, the the more experience you have, like the more we're able to negotiate and ask for, you know, for more. Um, and I will touch base on like uh, I think the question also said, have you had a bad assignment? Probably not. I don't know if mm-hmm. you've had a bad assignment. I but, did, uh, but I, I don't want to talk about uh, it. I'll, I'll touch base <laughs> on it really quick. Um, so that can happen okay we don't want to like not every assignment is going to be like you know a picture perfect assignment and whatnot right um so with that 
a lot of times, a lot of providers, uh, you know, don't speak on what's going on, okay? Or they try to, you know, try to go about it the wrong way. If you're on assignment, something is, even if you think it is, like even if it's nothing yet, or there's something that, you know, is a talk to your recruiter. That's the person you run to right away. You know, I typically, like whenever I put someone on assignment, the first week that they're working, we're talking every single day. If we can text, like, you know, if we can't text about it, once you're done, you know, I, I'll text you in the morning, I, you know, like, uh, let me know when you're done with your shift or at lunchtime or give me a call after. So we get to know for the first week, for the first two weeks, we're doing that, right? Just in case anything happens. And then I always set the precedent, like, you know, if anything happens, I don't want you going to, you know, have, get into it with, uh, you know, Debbie from the front desk or anything like that or the clinic manager, right? Like, come and talk to me. Let me handle it because that's why I'm here, right? I'm your warrior. I'm your guy. Like, I, I want, that's why I'm here. So you don't have to do that, okay? And then there's no, he said, he said like, you know, you let me know. We address it however we can do it. And we nip it in the bud or, you know, we come to a resolution of something of some kind. But yes, like a lot of times, you know, things end up happening because the providers realizing things, but not saying anything. And then the client like ends up misconstruing the words or something ends up happening. And they're like, wait, but this happened like three weeks ago. And I'm like, but you didn't tell me. I did not know. I, I didn't make a note of it or, you know, we didn't bring it up to the client so they could like, you know, so we have a record of it. So on, uh, on assignments, you know, be in constant communication with your recruiter. Your recruiter should be in constant communication with you too, asking how it is and, you know, all that and, and um, to avoid anything like that. Now, if something happens, like I, like we said here, you have your option of 30 day. In. It could be a weekend, um, you know, you have that you have that option it could be a weekend something happens it's not working out for you you don't feel safe let your recruiter know hey you know it, this really happened i almost died you know i don't know i'm being like a little dramatic but you know this mm -hmm. happened i don't know if i if this is for me i really can't do it you know we'll give it okay if nothing changes then we'll 30 day you know so because we're always looking for you for your best interest in the whole thing and we don't want like uh, anything bad in your record so that's what I would say about the bad assignment comment. Do mm -hmm. we have any, any more questions? Yeah. So do you have do more than one LLC or EIN number for your MP job and travel business? Yes. Yes, I do. Oh, that's, that's for you. Yeah. That's for you. Do you do your telehealth job at the same time you are on a locum assignment? If so, how do you make it work? Lord, my telehealth job is amazing. I could do it while I'm doing a, I could do it while I'm on assignment, depending how busy it is, like how busy the assignment could be. Or I can do it at any time. It's like really flexible. Um, every month you just tell them how many hours you can put in, how many hours you can put in for like a month or something like that. And if it changes, you just let them know ahead of time, you know? So um, yeah, it's very super flexible. Um, during COVID, I actually went back like a lot of providers and I worked um, as a RN, um, one of those uh, crisis assignments, and I was still doing my um, telehealth job just so that I could keep up my MP skills as well. But that's a topic for a whole nother, another realm, telehealth. So, yeah. <laughs> um, any questions? Please? Oh, you wrote that. Yeah. Uh, so... I think that was it. Anybody have any last minute questions before we head off? I don't see anything in the question box. I believe I answered everything. We spoke about how much you get paid already, depending on like your experience and where you're located and um, your flexibility as well. We spoke about that earlier and this live will be saved so that you can rewatch it. I didn't want it to be too, too long. We were supposed to be here for 30 minutes, but I knew it was going to be longer. Um, so just to give everybody the opportunity to rewatch things. Any last minute question, guys? You could just drop it down. Max, do you have anything to say? Um. Well, but, well first of all, Ms. Evans, I want to thank you. Thank you for, you know, for doing, for choosing me to do this with you, um, you know, how much I love working with you and uh, working with providers, period, you know, but especially you, 
definitely appreciate you with uh, you know everything that you do. You're you're literally you know I tell all my coworkers know about you because you know you're you're a great provider to work with. Um, but uh, and and anyone on this chat or anyone who's interested in locums, uh, I put my you know my at here i'm active on on instagram and you know we can we can set up a time to talk we can and i'll give you all the options and it'll be you know it'll be very and open and because i don't want to you know misconstrue the nation to you or, or to try and get you to say something only to try and get you to work and then when you go on it's not really that then max lied to you no 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 none of that i'll give you i know you kept it real with like me how from it the is <laughs> Oh yeah, from the from the jump, and and I I feel like you know it works a lot better like that. You know you know what you're getting into, and uh, you know if it's a good option for you, then I will I will help you. I will do my best, um, you know to to keep um you know things rolling like how they should be, and um yeah that's that's what I have to say. Reach out to me, and uh you know we'll talk and see if locums is a good lifestyle and a good fit for you. Right. I will. I want to end it off by saying that again. It might not be something that you do full time. If you are even even have like a thought about, hmm, I wonder how locum life is. Pick up like a two day contract, like you know what I mean, two days a week, or maybe one that sporadically that works for when you're off. You know, um. So definitely, definitely reach out to Max. He's super, 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 super available. So, you guys, thank you. I'm gonna wrap it up tonight. Absolutely. Um, you guys have a good night. Thank you, Max, Thank for you. also coming out and sharing Thank the information so with my audience. All right, y'all. Absolutely. Peace. Bye, everybody. <laughs>